First of all, can I uh, acknowledge that we've nicked a lot of, of the material we're going to talk to you about from a guy called Bob Walker. And without his work, it's, this presentation would not have been possible. Uh, if you want to see more about uh, Ripleyville, have a look at the in green there. It's not in green when it's up there. Uh, Rediscovering Ripleyville, is a, it, which is his, uh, his set of notes about Ripleyville, is a, a website called Rediscovering Ripleyville, all one word, um, at wordpress.com or at dot wordpress.com. So there's a lot more on there, but we've nicked a load of his stuff, and thank, I would, I'd like to say thank you to him. He would have been here this evening, would Bob, uh, but he's, he's not so well. Uh, he was invited to, to, to do this talk. Um, so thanks to, to James Roberts who researched and created this presentation. Sadly, very little of Ripleyville survives. But where was uh, Ripleyville and who was Ripley? Right, so uh, map on the left is obviously a modern map. Uh, top left, can you see the uh, centre of the town hall and the pool at the centre of Bradford? So you can see that the Bradford Interchange is there and the Ripley Valley is directly south of the centre. And it's really very close in. I don't actually know the distance there, but it's, it's, it's really not very far at all from the centre of, uh, of Bradford. But as I say, it doesn't exist anymore, so you'd be hard pushed to, uh, to see it. The picture on the, on the right is obviously of uh, Ripley himself. I'll tell you about him in a second or two. But I, I've not managed to find, James, James picked this up, but both he and I have managed to find where this comes from, this, this image. But I think the image tells us a little bit about uh, uh, Ripley, uh, Ripley already. It tells us that he was uh, sub, uh, the subject of a cartoon, <laughs> right? So he obviously was a public figure who people felt they could lampoon. And I, I've not worked out exactly what it is that's uh, so dangling all over him, but I think that the, the, the stuff that's dangling from his left-hand side is, is all the dyeing, all the dyes that he can use on cloth. It's like a sampling sample of these things. And there's, there's a lot of what appear to be banknotes in his back pocket, and they're all labelled commerce. So I think well, that this is a man of commerce who's very interested in, in money and also interested in, uh, in, in the business of the day. D-Y-E-I-N-G. Okay, so despite, this is the background to him, despite his non-conformist radical upbringing, by the time he built Ripleyville, uh, Henry William Ripley stood in opposition to Titus Salt and his ideas. Ripley's story could be told as a rugs to riches story, uh, but he was not a self-made man. By the late 1870s, he was one of Bradford's foremost capitalists, an industrialist, rentier, banker, local member of parliament, and an establishment figure. In fact, the, the dye works that uh, gave him his money comes down from his granddad, not just his dad. So he's, he's, he's part of a dinosty, and he's a third generation there. So Ripley was born at Bowling Lodge in Bradford, and after education at private school, he worked at his father's dye works in Bowling. Now, here we have a remarkable coincidence. It's not up here, but I mentioned it to you in an email I sent you. I've discovered that he's, he went, the private school he went to was the same private school that Akroy went to. <laughs> they, they, they were the same sort of age, so they would have known one another. Um, these had been developed, uh, the dye works, into an extensive concern by Edward uh, Ripley and were already one of the principal industrial establishments in Bradford. Under H.W. Ripley, the works were modernised and grew significantly, resulting in Ripley acquiring great wealth and being recognised as one of Bradford's big four industrialists, alongside Titus Salt, Samuel Lister and Isaac Holden. I'll leave you to look up Isaac Holden. I looked him up myself. Isaac Holden? Anybody have heard of him? Mm -hmm. okay. No, worth a look up. Right. Oakworth? Oakworth? Oakworth. 
Yes. Yes. That's that's yes. I, he's he, he built a vast mansion in Opeth. Yes. In, Ke- in Keighley. That's that's right. Yes. So that that's the guy. He's actually Scottish. One of two people, big big big, big industrialists around Salt's time in Bradford who came from Scotland. He met. Oh, right. 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 Yeah. So. Where are we now? We're not. Okay, next one. Uh, Ripley became MP for Bradford at a by election in 1868, but following a petition alleging corruption, this is modern stuff, isn't it? For, following a petition alleging corruption, uh, was, he was unseated later that year. He returned as an MP from 1874 to 1880, initially as a liberal aligned independent, then moving closer to and joining the Israelis' conservatives. His obituaries list other activities in public life, including as a borough and West Rye magistrate, member of the Bradford School Board, chair of Bradford Old Bank, chair of the Bradford Exchange, and president of the Philosophical Society. At the time of his death, his role in building Ripleyville was acknowledged, but not noted as a key achievement. So to that extent, all of that stuff is very reminiscent of Salt, isn't it? But very much, you know, being the MP and being a big person in public life. But unlike Salt, there is no definitive biography of Ripley. Bob Walker, the guy who has helped us so much on this, notes that after 10 years of admittedly intermittent and part-time research, I have only sketchy knowledge of H.W. Ripley's activities when in Parliament or in his role from 1848 as a borough magistrate and later as a West Riding magistrate. But we do know that Ripley was firmly opposed to the Labour movement. He fought the unionisation of his own workers and he made attacks on organised labour while campaigning for election. Very soon after his death, Ripley's reputation was significantly tarnished by the Newlands Mill disaster of 1882. The mill was part of the vast Ripley Mills complex and it was one of Bradford's worst industrial accidents with 54 workers killed, including 26 below the ages of 16. I mean, this is gruesome stuff really, isn't it? And apparently the, the problems with the chimney were experienced when they were actually erecting it. It wouldn't stay, it wouldn't stay in the vertical position and they took some, uh, they did some work on it, and that apparently worsened the situation. So it's one of those uh, uh, situations which can uh, have a big impact upon legislation and what have you. I don't know whether it did. Opinions about Ripleyville were also impacted by its ownership model, as the ownership of the houses. Ripley had intended the houses uh, to be for outright purchase. Very few were bought. And the scheme for rental purchase was abandoned due to low take-up. Reminiscent. Yeah. Construction of Ripleyville was later than both Salter and Ackroydon, but was achieved much more quickly. Uh, construction of the housing was started in 1865 and completed in 1868, so three years. That's uh, quite a big difference to Salter. Um, the church and vicarage were built between 1871 and 1875. Church at the end, church at the beginning, yes. Um, and financed by charitable subscription. The almshouses, those are the things that still exist, the almshouses, the rest, the rest of it's all gone. The almshouses were built in 1881. So the development at Ripley, Ripleyville took place against the backdrop of Bradford Council attempts to improve working class housing. I think this is a theme that's going through with Ackroyd. There's a big debate going on about housing for the working classes at this, at this period. Um, and uh, Bradford Council uh, legislated for law in 1860 intended 
to ban construction of back-to-back -back housing, though this was effectively relaxed by the 1866 bylaw, which allowed the construction of tunnel backs, effectively improved back-to-backs, which became the default model for working-class houses in Bradford well into the 1890s. Apparently, and I, I'm astonished about this, apparently uh, national legislation and back-to-backs uh, around this time as well. But Leeds kept on building them for the following 50, 60 years. I come from Leeds and I know about back-to-backs because I know people uh, lived there, including my, my wife lived in a back-to-back. -back. Um, and it's quite astonishing that Leeds kept on breaking the law for about 50 or 60 years. So the scheme, this is the scheme for housing. Uh, was initially announced at a public meeting in 1865 with a plan for up to 300 houses. 50% more than 196 uh, were, 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 which were finally built. Bradford architects Andrew, Son and Pepper were chosen. Later they were responsible for buildings including those that you can see in front of you and they did enhancements to the chimney at Salts Mill in the 1870s. 196 houses were built in three different sizes, 24, 25, 25 of the largest in two terraces, 140 in uh, intermediate size in nine terraces, 31 smallest of the smallest in two terraces. And you can see those, there's the, red, the red ones towards the top are the uh, largest ones. The intermediates are the yellow ones, and then right in between the group of yellow ones are the, the smallest ones, type three in two terraces. Like Salt Air, Ripley was laid out in a grid pattern adjacent to the owner's works and next to and surrounded by railways. The railways are very clear on there, I think. You can see those, yes? Um, and they literally were surrounded from the left and the right. But you can also see uh, how close the mill was because there's a mill pond bottom left as well, yeah? Ripleyville is the only model village within the borough of Bradford. Um, Ripleyville's location appears to be selected because of Ripley's ownership of uh, a significant land holding in the area. Uh, with 80 acres undeveloped in, uh, 80, undeveloped in 1865. The chosen site was irregularly shaped with steep gradients, but it formed part of a corridor which linked it to the town centre. And if you remember back to the initial map I showed you, it's very, very close to the town centre. The designs appear relatively plain compared to Saltaire, but were carefully laid out to provide a coherent effect the front elevations of each of the three types of houses were largely identical for each type, allowing for a unified appearance. Left and right-handed houses were used to provide symmetry with tall gabled houses providing punctuation. Different styles of gable window provided variation between terraces, while chimneys were placed to avoid chimney stacks on ter terminal walls. The Anglican church was designed by T.H. and F. Healy, another Bradford firm, in Gothic style with a stone interior, exterior, and a brick interior. I don't believe it was anything remotely as wonderful as that church in Ripleyville that you were showing us. But Ripleyville was designed as a complete town with facilities including shops, a church, a school, allotments and almshouses, though without the public buildings provided in Saltaire. A number of houses were deliberately intended for shops, by which I mean they were designed so, so they could be used as uh, shops. There's a bit of that in Saltaire, isn't there? We've got places that look a bit like houses and they're actually shops. By the 1871 census, there were six shops along Linton Street that still exists as Linton Street, although buildings don't, and a further two adjoining Ellen Street. The nearby locomotive inn on Ellen Street predated Ripleyville and was not part of the scheme. So this is a place without a pub, folks, and 
A later public house was constructed in the village, though not during Ripley's lifetime. Ripley provided land for the construction of their Anglican church on Via Street with space for 750 worshippers and for a vicarage about half a mile away. The building costs were met by donations as part of the Bradford Ten Churches campaign, including a substantial share provided by the Hardy family. They were the owners of the Low Moor Iron Works. I think you'll know about that if you've uh, studied anything about Bradford. And they were politically prominent in the Conservative Party. So you've got this link again, political link with them between uh, Ripley and uh, the Hardys. Ripley was reported as having a strong interest in education and the school was financed by him. It was run by a non-denominational charitable foundation. Ten almshouses formed the final and much later phase of construction in 1881. These replaced a group of almshouses which had been built by Ripley's parents at Bowling Lodge. The almshouses are some of the few remaining buildings and are now grade two listed. As noted before, houses were built um, according to th three templates. The um, largest ones were, had seven habitable rooms, the medium ones six habitable rooms, and the smaller ones five habitable rooms. All had both a front garden and rear yard with outhouse. Even the smallest of these were significantly larger than typical back-to-back -back and tunnel-back houses available to most Bradford workers, while the Type 1 and Type 2 houses provided space comparable to the so-called supervisors and managers housing in Saltaire. Another theme which is coming out for me from this discussion, these comparing and contrasting, is how good these, all of these houses were by comparison with stuff that was around. We're talking about a real step change in improved housing for working people, whether they're large or small, uh, and some of them were quite small here. And um, this is something that I've added into um, the, the, uh, the talk, uh, which uh, James didn't have in his original, but he did the, he did the calculations for this. <laughs> so that's rather nice. But I thought this was, was really interesting. We've got the square footage of the different houses in Saltaire uh, and in Ripleyville. The Saltaire so-called manager's houses. Uh, the reason why I say so-called is because when Lockwood and Mawson put the tenders out for these houses, they were called overlookers' houses or what have you. In reality, they weren't just for overlookers. It was for whoever could afford the rent. Right? Um, but we'll call them uh, managers and overlookers' house boats. So we've got the biggest houses of the managers' houses in, uh, in there. And then we've got the Saltaire overlookers' houses. Then the biggest of the Ripleyville houses. Then the med intermediate Ripleyville houses next. Saltaire large cottages, Ripleyville's smallest houses next. And then the typical tunnel back and uh, typical back to back, which are not part of either of these model villages, but those were the typical ones that were around for the working class under normal circumstances. But in these model villages, quite clearly, it's, the housing is a lot bigger and better. Okay. Ripleyville provided WCs in working class housing. This is really quite something. Um, a significant difference between Ripleyville and Saltaire. These toy, the ones in Saltaire, uh, all the ones in Saltaire outside at the back, yes? Yes? But these are, these are houses, these, these are actually toilets with the basements, that's quite an interesting thing as well, of, of the houses in Ripleyville. In 1866, while giving evidence to the Rivers Commission inquiry into the state of Bradford's Rivers and Canals, Ripley was quoted as saying that, I am going to build around about 300 cottages and I am so satisfied with my plans. These people knew how to be satisfied with their own creations, didn't they? I'm so satisfied with my plans that I shall adopt the same principle in all of them. I, I do not like to see cottages 
with nasty privies about them. I am putting a water closet in each and shall have an intercepting tank to carry out the same. So it's not, cer not certain whether this happened or not, though uh, Bob Walker suggests that this appears likely, appears likely all of the houses did have an internal WC. And, he, and Bob notes that installing uh, WCs in all houses um, uh, would have been in line with H.W. Ripley's intentions and would comply with the plans passed by Bradford Borough Council. The houses were originally intended for outright sale and preference was given to men employed in the immediate neighbourhood. I love the word men in that context, but it probably was the case that they would make the, <laughs> make the decision to buy at this stage. Few were bought and the scheme for rental purchase was dropped. The houses were slow to rent. Political opponents accused Ripley of charging exorbitant rents. Sadly, very little of Ripleyville survives other than the grade two listed almshouses. While the intention to offer housing for sale rather than to rent appears to have been a failure, this provides a unique and striking contact, contrast with other model villages. Well, I think that's wrong now that we've heard from about Ripleyville because you were selling you're talking about selling selling the houses there, weren't you, Ripley? Right? My apologies. Um, sanitation and the provision of WCs is now universal, though this was far from the case in Ripley's day and appears to have been a matter of importance to him. Ripley's motives in building Ripleyville were questioned at the time by his political opponents and to a greater extent than that of other industrialist builders of model towns. Ripley does appear to have intended something unique and striking. Whilst he was clearly unsympathetic to the left-wing ideas um, about the working class, he seems to have embraced the idea that workers could better themselves through property ownership and that he could help them to do that. 